morning, ladies and gentlemen, or should I say queens and drones. Um, I'm Dr. Kit and I'm a wild bee scientist, which means I study wild bees, but I'm also a wild scientist who studies bees. Um, and I think we need to use like lots of different forms of science communication to engage the community about science, about nature, because nature is for everyone, but yeah, different strategies work with, better with different people. So I work with all sorts of demographics from kids to adults to mature age learning, stu learning students to, um, yeah, all sorts of demographics. So I've done quite a bit of citizen science projects and I love them because it's so great engaging with people, especially kids, because um, they have the best questions. And um, yeah, it also comes with some challenges. And, you know, it's a learning experience along the way. So I'm going to talk about a few citizen science projects that I've done. Um, that there, that is one of our native bees. That is Megachile erythropyga. That is the main species that uses bee hotels, which I'll be talking about a little bit more as well. So bee hotels, they are artificial nesting structures that we can put up to help native bees um, have extra nesting habitat. So some of our native bees, they nest in little holes in wood created by wood boring beetles. And in urban areas or after fires, um, there's not as many of these nesting resources. Bee hotels are also a great way for you to see native bees because they come and back, come and go back to the same location. And um, it's like you can have your, like your little population of native bees in your yard. And you know, you don't own them, but they're there using your yard. Unfortunately, many companies have realized that people love native bees and want bee hotels and then they don't ask scientists about how bee hotels should be made. Um, and that can essentially lead to death traps for native bees if the structures aren't correct. So I did a lot of bee hotel research for my um, PhD and Put simply, the holes need to be less than a centimetre. Just drilling holes in wood, um, native wood, is, is really the best way to create a bee hotel. It doesn't need to be fancy. Don't have pine cones or shavings or any sort of thing like that. Just wooden blocks with holes in them. That's We're trying to replicate nature, right? Trees, holes that wood boring beetles create. So I've written a book about that as well. Um, if you're interested in that, send me a message. Um, and yeah put them in a semi-sunny location. You can also get um, bamboo and bundle it together. So I love bee hotels. I have them in my yard. I've used them so many projects because you can discover so much about native bee ecology because there's so much that we don't know. Like when I started my project, I put up bee hotels and I discovered there was a bee, um, Rosanapis igniter, that collects banksia fuzz and puts it in its nests. And we don't know why, it could be insulation. And this bee doesn't even go to the banks, banks to forage on it. It forages only off the basey, um, like the native pea plant. So just wild observations, which is re really interesting. And all these other things that you can discover just by observing and looking at bee hotels. So um, as you guys all know, in 2019, 2020, there was devastating bushfires across the country. And, um, you know, this burnt through a lot of habitat. And whilst after bushfires, flowering plants sometimes can recover, um, the, you know, the trees and the wood boring beetles, this can take a while for them to create those nesting resources. So I had this idea of putting up bee hotels into these areas. And what I wasn't doing, I wasn't putting up bee hotels into good areas and then moving the bees into these areas because that could essentially just, firstly, you shouldn't move bees around in different places. Secondly, you'd be putting populations, taking them from a good habitat, putting them to areas that might be terrible for them. So the bee hotels were to, if the bees move into these areas when the flowers are recovering after the bushfires, then they actually can populate and establish. And it's also a good way of seeing do the bees, you know, re recover in these areas after bushfires? Because that's something we had no idea about. So um, I had a citizen science project plus, plus 
um, my own, I guess, project in Southwest WA where my dad helped me make 1000 B hotels. Yeah, I know. Thanks so much to my dad. Um, and I went and surveyed them. And then there was also a citizen science project where um, we provided people with YouTube videos. I made some YouTube videos and you can watch them. So they're all there if you want to learn yourself. Um, I did workshops and um, information sheets, gave um, everyone that said they would participate in the project a copy of my book. Um, and so the idea was to put these bee hotels up and see do the bees go into these locations post fire. Um, so as um, uh, Laura and Bronte said before, often, and I think many of you will have experienced this, a sort of like decline in everyone is really interested and then there's a trickle down in how many people actually contribute. So yeah, that's something that I think I'd love to investigate further. How can we, um, I guess, keep up the consistency of people participating in um, citizen science and, you know, going out there every single month can be challenging. Like, you know, I was driving to my sites two hours, um, 10 times a month. So it was a lot. Um, so trying to keep that consistency up. So we had a lot, a lot of people interested and then only 90 contributed um, fairly inconsistently. But again, as Costa is saying, you know, the ripple effect, even if people weren't contributing to the I Am Actions project, we still had lots of people that made bee hotels through our workshops or became aware of native bees and the struggles that they might face after bushfires. Um, so we also found the bee hotels that I put up, and this is when I was in WA, it was amazing. Every single one of those 1,000 bee hotels was occupied by bees. Like, I was so happy. I had no, I, I thought maybe I'd be going out for half a year and just seeing no, nothing use them and just being sad that all my bees had like died from the fire. But I was so happy. Um, then the citizen science results were not as, um, as positive. So some people were so engaged and that was beautiful. And you also find that in citizen science project, some people become so passionate and they will send you like updates and extra information, which is wonderful. Um, some people less so. Um, and then lots of the, the hotels that they put up, only 10 holes were occupied with bees, um, but 66 bee hotels were occupied. So that was great. So there's a couple of reasons why it might not have been successful. So my research was in WA um, and all the citizen science um, ones were in the East Coast. Maybe the fires were more devastating there. Um, but also some of the bee hotels were not not made to what the bees like. Um, so that first one there, the holes are too big um, for the bees to use them. So all those white things there, um, that are, those are spiders. So spiders were recovering after fire. Um, the one in the middle, that's not one that anyone made. That's a store bought one. That is a not a good idea. Not a good idea. Um, like there's the wood shavings will just attract spiders. Lots of holes are too big. Um, there's sections that the bees won't use. Um, and then the last one, again, more of an insect hotel rather than a bee hotel. So yeah, you see how, how easy, like the ones at the top there, that's all you need to do. That's what the bees want. Those are the two, I was testing two types of bee hotels as well, bamboo and wood. Um, yeah, simple is better. The bees just want something that replicates something in nature, not some fancy thing. They, they just want, yeah. The trees. So keep the trees first, um, but then you can put up bee hotels. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, there's more information about um, bee hotels there. So that's the bee hotel thing. Then I'm going to talk about um, a project that I did with some other um, women in STEM. We were awarded the ESA um, Outreach Award, and as part of that, we then designed a project to go to schools. And um, that's my my colleagues there, and it was to look at the effect of color and configuration on um, essentially planting 
flowers and how that influences insects to visit them. Okay, so the first, my first idea was, yeah, looking at colour and configuration of flowers. I went to the school, there was no flowers at the school. Like, that's really sad. So that's something I would love to, I think, engage with schools more about and all of us can about planting flowers at schools because it was, yeah, pretty sad that this school had no flowers there. So I was like, okay, well, change of track. What are we going to do? Um, so artificial flowers. We came up with this idea of putting plates, um, coloured plates, um, and putting a little hole in the middle, an Eppendorf tube, putting sugar water in there, so sort of mimicking a flower. And we are looking at whether flowers were isolated or in clumps, whether they were separate colours or mixed colours. So that's the basic study design there. Um, and this has applications as well for, you know, planting in gardens, in the school gardens when they get flowers there or when the kids come home and talk to their mums and dads. And that was, you know, a beautiful thing about this project is that the kids were so interested and, you know, they'll go home from school. Like I remember going home from school and telling mum and dad what I did. So, you know, kids are amazing vessels for educating the public. Um, and so we were also telling them about how to identify different native bees, um, the diagnostic features, because this is something that most adults don't know either. Um, so telling the kids, this is what bees actually look like. It's not a yellow and black insect that makes honey. This is, this is bees. This is our indigenous bees. Um, so that was the study design. Pretty easy to replicate as well. So if they wanted to do it at home, they could as well. Um, and the important thing as well, putting them out there and making them watch them for 10 minutes. So learning the power of observation, just sitting there. Again, like lots of what uh, Laura and Bronte were talking about is relevant as well for my project. Sitting there, being like, just Zen, you know, you've got your apps and it's always pinging and there's always videos and things to watch. But you're just going to sit there and watch the insects for 10 minutes, which is really, you know, grounding and beautiful. Um, so we had a little spreadsheet. I just loved going through and looking at all their spreadsheets. Like they draw little pictures on them or like write little things. It was beautiful. Um, and so we did two days um, in late March. Um, that's not the perfect time for insects, but due to the constraints of the grant, that's when we had to do it. Um, and yeah, the potentials was it was cheap, it was replicable. And it was an opportunity for kids to see what scientists look like. Um, we're not, you know, all of us were women in STEM, which was really cool. We weren't like old guys in lab coats. Nothing wrong with old guys in lab coats, but yeah, like scientists can look like anything. Um, one of the issues was, and I think this is something that we now need to, oh, five minutes, okay, um, communicate is that no data is also data. Some of them just really wanted to record something so much. So if they saw an insect flying two meters away, they would record that. And I know because like we went to the schools, like it's just really sweet, but no data is also data. It's important to be like, well, this isn't working. Um, and yeah, constraints on timing, unclear how transferable plastic plates with sugar water are to real flowers. Okay, finally, um, I have a Facebook group called The Buzz and Wild Bees. I started off when I started my PhD um, and it was called the Bees and the Burbs just to, I guess, get participants so that I can visit their gardens. So I was visiting people's gardens for my PhD. Um, and I realised very early on my PhD that people didn't know that there were native bees. Um, they didn't know about their ecology. And I thought that was really sad because I started to realise native bees are everywhere. You can go out and see them anywhere in your garden. So I created this Facebook group and... Um, Unfortunately, Facebook has now made it non-shareable. Like you can join it, but the post can't be shared outside of it. So anyway, um, I've got some um, citizen science groups. Um, one on bee hotels, and then I was doing one um, concurrent with my PhD, looking at when and where people see bees in residential gardens versus bushland. And that's what I was doing. Um, but I also wanted to expand the reach outside the sites that I did. Um, pros and cons of using Facebook. Um, no extra apps because everyone has Facebook, well, most people are in it already. It's transfer, open, everyone can see the data. 
um, and then I can provide verification assistance. I'm on there every single day IDing fees for people. Um, harder to enter on the phone, subject to mistreatment. It's like I don't have people delete my spreadsheets um, and this is when it was a public group outside the app. It was just a nightmare um, and then harder to control the number of observations. But the beautiful thing is that... Um, yeah, uh, like there's been some amazing citizen science observations, discovery of like an introduced bee species from Africa that's now in WA, and that's thanks to people going onto the Buzz and Wild Bees and uploading their photos and me being like, wow, that's actually an amazing observation. That's a species that's not here before. Um, so yeah, citizen science projects are wonderful. They're a great way to expand your outreach, but there are some considerations that you need to think about. You need to really think about your goal, not just gather data. Um, strategies to encourage ongoing participation. Um, and, you know, all of this is like me volunteering. So it's a lot of effort. If there's any, I guess, ways to ramp up and realize that this is, this is a real project, this is science, not just, you know, people just like watching things like this is real science and people need to realize that we need to actually really appreciate this um and yeah no results are still results um so i think the role of citizen science like i'm i love the buzz on wild bees community um it's thriving people are always putting up amazing photos there and and said published a paper from an observation that someone put up there um and yeah Everyone wants citizen science, but I guess like government and stuff don't fund it that much or nature in general, which is really sad. Um, and it's incredibly valuable to complement academic science, but not replace it. So I think it's a partnership between scientists um, and citizen science is really beautiful. And that's where we can get the most value. Um, also, tomorrow I'm doing a citizen science thing at Mooloola River National Park, which is literally around the corner. It is beautiful. And, um, yeah, it's on tomorrow. I think it's it starts, oh, it's a bit, one to three, yeah. Um, absolutely beautiful patch of native bushland. Um, so if you want to come and do some, some science and look at some insects with me, um, yeah, now's your opportunity. Oh, and, yeah, thank you to... Buzz and Wild Bees member, Australian Citizen Science Association, Association, Costa, who was just like amazing and has supported me throughout the whole time and such an amazing advocate for citizen science and nature. And um, my colleagues, the Sea Grant that got me here, and the ESA. Thanks. Hey, Kit. So we've got time for one or two questions. So you mentioned about your father slaving away making a thousand um, bee hotels. Yes, yeah, I helped. In, in, <laughs> I'm sure you did. I know in New Zealand we've got a thing called Men's Shed where retirees go along and they actually significantly contribute to conservation by making rat traps, sometimes possum traps, etc. Have you reached out to any of those sorts of organisations to basically voluntarily produce your um, bee hotels so that you can push it out either to gardens or... Other places? Yeah, so I had actually a mentor help me with my bee hotels for my original PhD project. Um, I did want to make the bee hotels very standardised. So I think that's that's the challenge there. As, same with lots of citizen sciences. For the best quality results, for, um, they have to be super, super standardised. And sometimes, you know... Yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. Um, like, yeah, Men's Shed's definitely really helped with my initial PhD um, hotels, and I would love to get in contact with more Men's Sheds and give them the resources about making bee hotels that are designed, yeah, for, for native bees. So, yeah, they are a wonderful resource, and I definitely should get on to contacting more. So thanks for your suggestion. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Kit. Um, absolute powerhouse she is in, uh, in our native bee world and uh, she's constantly out there 
not just advocating, but writing and, and doing her work, particularly with her, her doctorate and the community engagement that she's doing. So, Kit, thanks for everything that you do. And uh, thanks for being here as part of the, the Citizen Science Conference today. <laughs> <laughs>